good evening and welcome to The Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. It's Thursday, the 6th of October, 2016, and I trust you're all keeping well. I'm very happy with the feedback to the show and how things are going so far, especially regarding the Sunday Sermon Show. And I'm delighted to keep it up as long as I can continue to find topics of both interest to me and interest to you too. So thank you for any suggestions you have. In fact, one person suggested there on a recent video, the last on YouTube, that why don't I make a film about esoteric Dublin? Well, that's very much in the works. I've written a script for a film. I want to, even if I can't get the best professional equipment, I want to finally do that story justice. I want to also it to be the first of a series of films visiting the great esoteric and occult centers of the world. And Dublin, I will start out with because it's my hometown and also because it hasn't been properly done yet. The problem, in fact, very few play of anywhere has been properly done. I think the guy Horowitz did quite a good one on New York, but that's because he approached it correctly. All the others have all been done, but for true to either Christian conspiracy theory or theosophist or worse of all, in Ireland's case, from the British Israelite aspect in ireland british israelism is a is a disease which infects our entire sense of self and this is where the whole nonsense of the whole pharaohs behind the irish and the hill of torah and all the sort of crap that's peddled by various individuals out there come from it what this is not what this is a psyop this is a distraction that's not really how it happens or what went on it's like astrotheology there's one or two things real but the majority of it that you hear on the internet is complete made of bunkum it's just finding things that sound like things so i want to finally do these stories justice because they won't be done from a christian a conspiratorial to a sense or a british israelite point of view that presented exactly as they were as these concept ideas places and symbolisms were put there by the initial architects, Freemasons, and city fathers, and alchemists, and so on. And I hope you'll be enjoying me on this journey. It's uh, about time it was done. It's something I've wanted to do for a while, so that's definitely in the work, a you know, a Dublin shadow land, a Dublin shadow zone, whatever documentary is on the way, and hopefully you'll get a lot from that and you'll enjoy it, and I look forward to making it. It's just logistics again. I'm just so busy, but it will be done. Don't worry. It's a it's a strange time at the moment. We had all the, the mass clown sightings again. I spoke about the Pazuzu energy last Sunday show, and that's what's causing all these mass clown sightings. You're also going to see things like uh, desecration of churches and holy statues. I knew something was up uh, not too long ago when graveyards were being attacked around Ireland, and this usually is an indication of these, this Pazuzu psychic energy. Now, remember, Pazuzu is not necessarily an entity, a single being that possesses one human being or anything like that. Demons, for all we know, are energy forces. They're forces of the psyche and they're forces of energy. We only conceptualize them as actual literal beings because the zoomorphic and anamorphic images that we use to picture them are merely just ways for the human consciousness to encapsulate to encapsulate the idea. Humans have always done this. I was reading a very interesting document document there about it was a research paper on megaliths in Sweden and it was discounted the local folklore was of what of these megaliths was immediately discounted by the experts, which is an awful shame. This is something I tried to put right in the Druid code book. In this case, they were talking about the common cup marks. These are little holes that you often find. They're like little scoops of stone that you find in megaliths all over Europe, all over the world, in fact. And the local folklore in Sweden said that they were fairy holes. And what the locals used to do was put a seed inside them to try and plant a seed within the fairy world. So there was almost like a, a gift to the fairies, but it was also a way of transferring human consciousness into the fairy world consciousness. And of course, this was immediately dismissed as being anything other than a local superstition, unfortunately. But these things are how our leaders used, well, not so much now. I have to to say, since science became a religion of its own, these were the kind of things that were held by our leaders. This is why they had needles or 
pointed arc, pointed spires next to round domes. These were all part of the Masonic fertility rites. It doesn't make it evil. It doesn't make it... In many cases, it was done for things such as building the city's commerce and power. It was a fertility rite. It's only evil if you're a Christian. If you're a, a, a Freemason involved in this kind of architecture, it's just, a, it's just a, a magical form of concentration to bring prosperity to the city. This is what it's all about. Now, there are, are aspects of cities that revolve around debt. For instance, in Dublin, you have St. Stephen's Green. That was the city's execution ground, and that was the square of debt. And it's still the square of death to this day, because when you enter into the into that park, you have to will pass on the, the Boer War Memorial Arch, where you get the lists of all the people who were killed in the Boer War. On the other side of the square, there's by the new government, there's an arch devoted to the people who died in the Irish War of Independence. You're inside death. Now, that doesn't mean it's satanic or evil. Debt, just like life, sex, and everything else, is an aspect of existence. And you, you incorporate these aspects of existence into cities. You have areas for sex, procreation, debt, life, fun, enjoyment, experimentation, knowledge. They're not evil things. They are what they are. They represent, The city itself is no different in how it's laid out than, the, say, the Kabbalistic tree or the the great mountain of the alchemist with the beehive in the middle, surrounded by the four elements suspended in the ether. If the cities were planned, specifically the cities that were built after the restoration, which took place in after the Great Fire of London, these Freemasons all moved in and said, great, we have a clean blank canvas we can build our esoteric world upon. And that's what that all came from. They were fulfilling what basically John Dee had done in the Elizabethan Tudor court. It's not evil. This is what I'm saying. Get out of this Christian, you know, Christian British Israelite mindset. The world exists beyond the Middle East. It's just a way of encapsulating aspects and energy forces. Now, this week, I suppose that the theme of tonight's show will generally revolve around this idea. But this week, we had the Nobel Prize for Physics given to somebody who had discovered something called strange matter. Now, this is a cop-out. What we're seeing when you hear things like strange, strange matter, dark matter, junk DNA, you're hearing about, you're hearing terms for the things that reductionist science can no longer explain. Reductionist science has now reached its absolute finite point, and they're now moving into the world of mysticism. They may call it dark matter. They may call it the Higgs boson, which they never discovered, by the way. They may call it junk DNA. They may call it this, that, and the other. But that's just the new vernacular, the new magical language they're using that the same thing ever ancestors used. There's no doubt that that Shiva statue in the front of the Seren complex will have the final laugh. This is why I am and always will remain a Fortean. There is no such thing as absolute truth in terms of the mechanics of the universe and the underlying nature of reality. There's only things we experience as a fashion for a while. This is why the people who painted the images in the cave art in Lacau in France were literally building their consciousness through this development of hunting magic. The same why magic is so central. It's the same thing with the Higgs boson at CERN and why they're building a larger particle collider. The magic circle is being increased. They're constantly diving deeper and deeper into the esoteric because reductionist science has reached its limit. They can't explain consciousness. They still can't un explain the, un the fundamental mechanics of the universe. And this is what we have to be also careful to. We're very quick. People that say the new age or the alternative scene are very quick to embrace quantum ideas. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it's just the language. You have people like Anthony Peake who've done this very, very well in his work. We're, again, we're using concepts to explain things. We're not explaining what they absolutely are. So when I talk about Pazuzu energy or Karan's on 333 energy, they may manifest in our consciousness a specific structures in terms of their symbolism. In reality, that's not what they are. 
In reality, they are simply energy forces, and this conceptualization of them through an artistic form allows us to understand the idea much better. It also allows us to pin it. Now, there's also a kind of a, a psychic feedback aspect to this, in that suppose when you, it's the idea of you don't name a demon, the demon comes in reality. This is why in that joke of Monty Python in the film, The Life of Brian, he says, don't use the term Jehovah. Because Jehovah is a super demon. This is what the Jews know. The Jews know that Jehovah is a super demon who's as evil as he is good. And humanity's concept and ideas around this Jehovah entity is to manage it. And this is what the Kabbalah is about. To manage this creature for the benefit of all humanity. To try and hold this planet intact. Because this force can easily spill out of control as the Jews discovered in the 6th century when they went into Babylon. It, was, it, it, it has to be it has to be carefully managed. Now, so it's a double-edged sword. On one one you, one term, one level, you can give it the name Quranzon 333, Pazuzu, Beelzebub. You, you can give it these names, Astaroth. You can give them these names. But you're also bringing it into manifestation. So it's it's a fine line. This is what the great wisdom of the ages has always been about. This is why you can find so little information, even when you get deep into the into the Freemasonic text, because they're aware that too much information brings forth things that can't be controlled. It's almost like messing with nuclear science. It's the same kind of idea. You just can't, or messing with flammable chemicals. You just can't throw everything together. You will cause an explosion. Everything has to be carefully managed. And so that's those clown sightings that were being subject to all around the world. There's a couple in Dublin the night. This is the manifestation of Pazuzu energy, the trickster clown on the dark side. And we'll see more of this kind of thing until this blows over. Have you also noticed as Pazuzu is disrupting, shall we say, our everyday lives in terms of how we're living, how things have gone very quiet on the global stage? We're not hearing much about what's going down in Syria. We're not hearing much about foreign policy. That's because the people in charge are aware of these energy forces too, and they don't move until it's safe. The United States will not make a decision until this period passes. Neither will Russia, neither will anyone else. They're fully aware of psychic forces just as much as we are. doesn't matter what we call them, what they call them. They know they're going down, and they watch just like I tell you to watch your Facebook feed like a hawk, they watch the world like a hawk. This is why they've always wanted data and information because human beings, particularly dysfunctional human beings, or dysfunctionalities which originate within the human condition are a magnificent indicator of the psychic weather of the planet. And you must always pay attention because if you can do this, you'll have a more enjoyable life. So those of you who are listening to this show and my show, you know now about this Pazuzu aspect that we're caught in at the moment. But you also know that it's temporary. You also know how to write it out. I told you. So you're in a state of power. You're not in a state of victimhood. In the past, when everything was, was, was going to pieces and falling apart, you were often confused. What the hell is going on? Now you know what's going on. It's just like if we're being attacked, you go into the air raid shelter. That's the purpose of my work and everything I've done. If you're being psychically attacked, I will help you to build the air raid shelter and tell you how long you should stay in it. And that's not fear. That is common sense. That's all that is. All that is is common sense. And so that's where we are now. We've reached the finite limits of material science. And They've gone into the land of mysticism again. And this is why the my work and people like me, our work will always endure. Even the ones that are in who have gone off into woo-woo land, there'll always be aspects of this that will be true. That doesn't mean, and this is very important as you're listening out there, that all of it is true. That's not that's not how it works at all. It only becomes true if you can actually find a verifiable reference to it that resonates with both your consciousness, psyche, and reality. Pin it down. And that, so that's what the purpose of symbolism is. And when the, the scientists at CERN or the management team at CERN erected the god Shiva in front of the particle collider, this was an admission on their behalf 
that ultimately they're just trying to get back to what we've always known from the very start. This problem of dealing with the occult in terms of relaying this information, this idea of symbolism versus, should we say, consciousness or psychic forces, it, it it's never it seems to go away. But there was a, on the, the bullshitist uh, pay, website, Mitch Horowitz, who's done some good work on the occult, very good work, in fact. He wrote, wrote an article called Why Is It So Damn Difficult to Discuss Occult Topics in Media? I'll just go read through the article here. I am a historian of alternative religions. I document and deeply care about outsider spiritual views, particularly with regard to the esoteric, supernatural, and occult. I've managed to write about these things seriously in mainstream news outlets from the New York Times to the Washington Post and discuss them on CBS Sunday Morning and Dateline NBC and NPR's All Things Considered. But it is a struggle. I find that the bar is raised much higher for writing about outside the top fold topics than it is for editors that produce what and produces what they already believe. Here are some of the reasons it's tough to find a mainstream mic for these issues and some different ways to think about how we should communicate them. Disavowal is the price of admission to the mainstream media. I love journalist John Ronson. I don't, but anyway. (laughs) But he plays this game all too well. Absolutely he does. He studies a fringe topic like ESP in the military, depicting it as hooey. But then he says ingenuously, In an interview, the psychic spies do have some success that you can't explain. There are stories of remote viewers divining map coordinates or sketching something that does, in fact, lead to something. Maybe. That, to me, is where to start digging. But Ronson quickly slams shut the door. Critic Janice Maslin in the New York Times admiringly quotes him, calling his foray into into ESP as frivolous. I have no particular solution to this, as I refuse to disavow my sympathies any more than historians such as Robert Peel, Gershom Sholem, and Richard Lamann Busham should be expected to, respectively disavow their dedication to Christian science, mystical Judaism, or Mormonism. Two, cable producers often deem f- fraud and f- fudging more sellable than fact. Well, that's absolutely true. Anyone who's watched that alien, ancient aliens bullshit. This is a source of constant frustration. This is why I do fewer cable documentaries than I used to, good man. Producers want you to juice stuff up. If you don't comply, they may not do it for you. For example, a certain show on the Travel Channel wanted me to do a piece based on my tours of occult imagery in Grand New York's Grand Central Terminal. I made it clear that I didn't deal with conspiracy theories, fantasies about the Illuminati, or any such stuff, and wouldn't discuss these things other than to voice my disavowal. Now, this happened to me also when someone was wanted me to do on a pair on a show like that about giants. I refused to mention the giants in the Bible, and yet that was supposed to be the, the beginning and end punctuation marks and focal point of the whole thing, that it was in the Bible, therefore it's true, when there's other very compelling evidence for giants. Returning to the article, you can witness the sneaky results right here, but you'll all come back now, it gets better. For my real views on the Grand Central, check out this mini doc from the Midnight Archive. Check that out too. It's called The Cult uh, New York. On a happier note, I am. I also participate in a Discovery Channel documentary called The Secret Secrets of Secret Societies, which was more ardently factual than I had hoped for. Not that I stand by the testimony of every talking head in it. I told the truth, and they used it. Conspiracy theorists have a passion for making connections. It explains everything. It simplifies everything. If an individual looks out the window and sees a world racked with tragedy, accident, unexpected events, all he has to do is take a leaf from the conspiracy theory and suddenly everything seems complex. That's that once seemed complex before seem now seems simple. And his fear and his anger now have a target. Well, that's exactly true. That's why I've been telling you all not to get caught up from day one with the psychopaths. Yeah, that's a problem, but it doesn't mean you have to become witch hunters. It also doesn't mean that you should be helpless and wait for something to be done on your behalf, or it, you, you should still work on solving your own life, regardless of what the exterior problems are. Number three, the greatest barrier to seriously discussing the occult 
and the offbeat in public is the inability of critics and gatekeepers to understand that seriousness depends not on the topic but on terms of engagement. That's a very important point. This is a persistent problem in our intellectual culture. Many academics and journalists sim simply cannot wrap up their minds up around the principle that you can study an arcane topic without propagating it. For example, a friend of mine who is a professor of French history at the New York University recently wrote a biography of Notre Dame as he wanted to consider all aspects of the 16th century's procrastinator's life. Sorry, prognosticator's life including his work as a professional astrologer. He discovered that Nostradamus had a poor grasp of the generally agreed upon tenets of astrology in his time. He was actually a bad astrologer, my friend told my friend told colleague. Is there such a good thing as a good one? The colleague replied, can you see the obtrusiveness in the remark? My friends said, study nothing to do with the value of astrology, but with evaluating Nostradamus as a pra practitioner. In a recent debate about the legacy of 19th century occultist H.P. Plavatsky, which we're going on about now for, what, 140 years, my friend Richard Smalley, historian and philosopher of mystical tradition, remarked, this is a great, there is a great deal of value in H.P.B.'s work, and in, that's Helena Plavatsky, and a great deal of nonsense, I would agree with that. I see absolutely no reason to be forced to either take it or like it, like it all, this false choice of to take it or like it is perhaps the most limiting factor in how people view the world. Could not agree more. It makes it difficult to discuss esoteric topics and it wreaks hell on our political dialogue. For example, look at the video below. In a typical comment, someone, someone posted on the YouTube and I recount this almost humorously. He doesn't even believe what he's saying. Lying through his teeth. Watch his eyes. Watch my eyes indeed. Number four, finally, when reasonable people don't get in the mix, the space gets filled by wing nuts. A lot of sloppy, anti-intellectual people are drawn to occult topics. Oh, boy, are they. They find them spooky, paranoia-inducing. That sound familiar? And fun. But these toe dippers often... Propagate conspiracy dreck. I'm talking, I'm talking to you, Alex Jones, that impoverishes our entire culture. That is finally why I keep it at. As the social activist and writer Michael Harrington once said in a different context, we all call ourselves socialists because it's truth. All we have is the truth. Mitch Horowitz was raised in a world of Bigfoot stories, UFO sightings and Carlos Castaneda books. He grew up determined to find the truth behind it all and today Mitch is a Penn Award winning historian and the author of Occult America and One Simple Idea of How Positive Thinking Reshape Modern Life. Interesting guy to look up. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. The article was a quick, was basically sound like they quickly interviewed a guy over the phone and uh, put it out there. But fundamentally, what he is saying is true. You can It's very difficult for anyone to discuss occult topics with anyone in the mainstream, with perhaps the exception of Alan Moore, and that's only in the British mainstream media. And that's mainly because they, they skirt around it and concentrate particularly on his work in fiction and in things like the, the comic book world that he came from. You're kind of given a leeway if you're an artist, but otherwise you could never have a situation where you can sit down and talk about it because the results is that it already doesn't exist. Now, religious groups are already starting to find this out for their own, you know, for themselves. But what happens is because we discount the idea that the other person hasn't got an opinion, a kind of fundamentalism appears in it. And it's also very, it's, off, it's often extremely nihilistic where you go and is a reflection of the psychology of the person actually saying it. I read a quote recently, in all, in all places in a Catholic free newspaper by Stephen Hawking, where he said that the human race is just a, a pond of scum living on a minor planet. That's how he views the human race, pond scum. Because what's, he's, he's, He's projecting his own feelings about himself. Now, it's not his fault he's disabled, but he's been, it's somehow he's, this guy's been dying forever. Someone recently said on my friends list, and I completely agree, if Stephen Hawkins didn't suffer from motor neuron disease, no, most people would think he was a lunatic. 
but because he or ignores scientific processes, but he's, he's only famous because people feel sorry for him. There's a lot of truth to that. For instance, his work on black holes is absolute bunk. No, no one, no serious cosmologist takes black holes as fact anymore and hasn't done so probably since the early 1980s. And yet he's still writing about black holes as if they absolutely 100% exist. And they're still extremely theoretical. But that's that's how it is. You know, that's what you're dealing with. So in science, you have this, you know, you can't, no one's actually shown a black hole. No one's shown you dark matter. No one, but you have to believe them because it's the science, right? But if someone has to talk about ESP or anything, the stuff I work at talk about archetypes and energy, well, that can't be talked about because you can't prove it. So it's, it's everyone's woo-woo of choice is really what it comes down to. But that's why I'm, I'm looking back in the past, not just in contemporary ideas regarding, shall we say, esoteric, occult, Fortean ideas, but look through the past because – this is the problem also with the people who are on the sort of open-minded side because they will actually stick with the, the writers and the, the cont- commentators on these topics they, they, they hear today and, and believe that that's the, that's the finite guiding principle. It's not. Now, a few weeks ago, I, wrote, I read an, an essay written by a woman back in 1917 called Clara M. Kuhn. It was on what, you know, energy and life forces. And this is another, I managed to find another essay by the woman. There's nothing about her online, so don't be about to look. You can, this is why I said, keep yourself print libraries. And it's a, from a Theosophist newsletter. Yes, I collect everything. And it's called Reincarnation's Answers to Life's Problems. Now, bear in mind that this is written at a time where she probably could have been done for witchcraft laws in the UK. So you have to kind of skirt around. That's why Jesus and so on is often brought into these things. But this is from Bibby's annual, and I want to read this to you. This is by Clara M. Kud's essay on reincarnation. Now, we're dealing with the 19th, like the 20th century. At bit, we're talking 100 years ago now. If we believe in the immortality of the soul, and there are few people who do not so believe it these days, there are only two possible hypotheses for life and living. One, rapidly disappearing under the pressure of modern thought, is the doctrine of a special creation, namely that when a child is born, a new soul is created from nowhere, out of nothing to inhabit the new body. And gifted, that was the old-fashioned term, in some cases, with so much in the way of powers of mind and heart and environment, and in the other cases with so little, that it is common parlance to say, of the latter. He never had a chance from the beginning. And on the deed done, in this present short span of life, an eternity of bliss or woe is said to depend, placing upon finite causes and infinite results. The first shock this theory received came from the popularization by Darwin and others of the great truth of evolution, a teaching which not only revolutionized the scientific thought of the day, but insensibly began to affect the outlook of every other department of our common life. It began to be seen that nothing ever comes suddenly into being, but that every form of life in is in itself in of itself, both the result of a previous process of gradual development and the promise of still further unfoldment. A stage in a continual ascent from lower and simpler towards higher and more complex organized forms, expressing the varying powers of life with increasing precision and delicacy. Not only this, but the spiritualistic movement of the Victorian age demonstrated the fact that the passage through the great doorway of death made no miraculous or inherent change in a man. He was the same man in the day after the death of his body as the day before. With the same memory, desires and interests, he was neither made fit for an an eternal heaven, nor an eternal hell. These two forces in modern thought have gradually brought about an entire change in our conceptions of life here and the hereafter. If anyone doubts this, let him cast his mind back to the sermons delivered 50 years ago, the burden of which was most mostly preparation for debt and judgment, with vivid references to pains of the eternal hell. We rarely hear such sermons now, and quite a number of the clergy 
of all denominations postulate at a time of further development upon the other side, whereby a man, even the worst of men, may win pure purification and ultimately be made ready for the courts of heaven. Only one asks himself, if further steady development is plainly needed, why should it take place upon the other side? Has the school of earth no like the school of earthly life no more to teach us? Would not further lessons be the best learnt in similar conditions? This brings us to the second possible hypothesis of life. It is that true that it is true it is it be true that the body in which a man dwells, Anglo-Saxon Bovic, the abode or dwelling pace, is the present fruit of an age-long process of gradual development. Must it not be equally true of him who dwells in that body? True of the soul as well as the body, an evolution of the soul and its habitation which proceeds. And if so, then... This is not the first time that any one of us has come into the school of life, nor will it be at any means the last. In the great journey of the soul, and in the little life of the body, progress is punctuated by days and nights. Days in which we work, nights in which putting off the working clothes of the body, we rest, and on and on until it is fulfilled. Reincarnation, resurrection, in not of a body, is the only other available hypothesis, the doctrine of evolution applied to the soul. But what is it that seeks fulfillment? Evolution teaches us another truth, that the powers and capacity manifested in any forms of life lie latent already in the very first beginnings of that life. Looking thuswise on the soul of man, what are the inherent powers and capacities which seek manifestation therein? For man is only half-developed soul. It doth yet appear what we shall be. There is a statement common to all the great scriptures of the world. In the words of our own, God made man in his own image. Something in man shares the divine perfection and eternity. It is embryonic of him. And this is the hidden drive, the purpose, the propulsion which is behind every one of us upon this great journey. Now it is said of the microcosm that in manifestation he, one, becomes three. Equally true is the microcosm man. He manifests in life in three great ways, simultaneously thinking, feeling and acting. And the ideal, the archetype of the threefold activity is wisdom, love and power. Hence, Latent in man is the germ of the divine trinity of power, slowly to be drawn forward from latency into full potency through the educations of life's successive never-failing experiences. The fall of man, the descent of the son of... I'm just going to turn the pages here. ...of God into the cycle of the earth's experiences of necessity in the beginning means the temporary triumph of matter over spirit. But as life succeeds life, rather let us say as day succeeds day in our real life, so does the spiritual, the real self, slowly commences to conquer, to subdue, to express itself in matter, and thereby transform, transfigure, and utterly redeem it, becoming in the end, as did the firstborn of earth's humanity, the Christ, once more a unity, not by conversion of the Godhead into the flesh, but by the taking of the manhood into God. This is Rosicrucianism, hardcore here. Interesting how she used in 1922 the term archetype, which has not been around that long by that, at that time. This is what reincarnation really means. Remember uh, Carl, Jung's, Carl Jung's father, came, Carl Jung came from a family of Rosicrucians. This is what uh, reincarnation really means. Then this thought comes how unequally in the inner divine beauty expressed, nay, in some seemingly not at all, the difference does not lie in inherent capacity, but in growth and development, in age. For in this big human family, as in the smaller units to which we belong, no brother is of the same age of development. 
On the one hand, we see people of such remarkably small mental stature as the Aboriginal savage who cannot count more than five. You, you know it's old when they're starting to use terms like Aboriginal savage. Whose memory will scarcely stretch from one day to another. She's really talking about a consciousness here compared to the free association of native tribes. This is what's good about reading these older, these older essays. The developments that have taken place since cast a kind of enlightenment back upon these that, you know, it's very, you know, it's one of the things in modern life is that course how quick to call her a racist because she used those terms and saying that the Aboriginal savages don't think so well. But since in recent times, we now know that the natives peoples don't have to record, memorize the amount of things a modern slave human does because they operate through a, fun through a function of free, free association. In many ways, they're healthier. In the region of the heart, it is the same. There are those who have no sense of right and wrong, little sense of honor or compassion. And on the other hand, those lovely and gracious features, such as the grace and the saints of the kingdom of, of every fate. Then too, there are the great army of the incapables, those whom no amount of training can ever really make proficient. And their corresponding body of great administrators, soldiers, statesmen, organizers of all kinds. See, I've been telling you, this is many shows have I done where I said, Stop trying to wake up the masses. You will never will. You're wasting that energy that you need to, to, to grow yourself, to develop your own psychic, spiritual, and consciousness and intellectual development. They can't be woken up. You're wasting your time. And this woman here, Clara M. Kuda, is saying exactly the same thing. Somewhere between these two extremes, every one of us is standing. We can look at with understanding, patience, utter compassion upon one, knowing that there are verily the little ones of humanity's brotherhood here to be helped. It, if so, we can be, we are, if so be, we are wise to learn how. We can gaze in wonder, admiration, inspiration at the other, knowing that they lead whither to we shall ourselves in due time climb. Life is so splendid when viewed in the light of reincarnation. Now, what she's saying here is, and it's a very good point. When I say don't wake people up, you're wasting your time. It's far more profound and deep than just you wasting your time. Firstly, these people in their present state of reincarnation can't be woken up because they're at a, a more infantile level of soul development, where you're probably on a higher level, hopefully. And depending on how you react to that, is how you treat these other people. You don't get involved. Their process is ongoing. And likewise, your process is ongoing. However, and I can't stress this enough, if you devote all your time into wanting to wake up the sheeple, or, or, you know, waiting for an event to happen or the, the human race to get off its knees, you're actually robbing yourself of your own spiritual development on your journey here. So don't, don't be robbing from yourself. But it may be asked, how then shall we find, again, in all long turnings of the future travel, those whom we know and love? He who asked this has not understand the nature of love, the divine power sustaining and creating new worlds. In lowest forms, it operates as a chemical affinity. It is even the force which keeps atoms and molecules together. And shining through human hearts, there is no power in heaven or air to say it nay. We love our friends because we have already learned to know and love them before. Each life makes the bronze stronger. For we move through our big life journey as we move through this little miniature one. In, co in, the, in company with one, our particular friends and associates, some of whom are with us all the time and others only now and again. Only we do not always find our beloved in the same relationship. In one life, it may be that of a husband and wife, a parent or child, brother or sister, great friends, from what is a relationship, but a quite particular, particular and personal way of getting to know another human soul and it's not so much more beautiful to know the ones we love in all of the ways of love that exist in god's universe 
than in only one. Now, what she's saying here is that two people who could be lovers in this life may have been husband and child in the others, or maybe even had they could have been their pets. You see, this is what's happening. We're learning. We're we're going through a gradual process of this this you know distillated compassion. That's really what's happening. Then again, too, with other differences differences of race, creed, class, sex, there are superficial differences constituting classes in life school, which give us a certain outlook and enrichment of experience and to assimilate by the soul shown forth in future lives as character and capacity. It is easy to see that once the truth is fully recognized, the whole viewpoint regarding the individual and social problems will become radically changed. And indeed, many problems will find Many problems will find at once their own solution. Problems, for example, of government, social reform, penal reform, education. What is the real eternal problem of government but to find some means to right people to govern? While not providing us with a ready-made system of doing this, reincarnation gives a criterion of judgment. We are the elders in a nation of clearly power and responsibility should rest in their hands. Not necessarily the ready-tongued politician or the plutocrat, but those in whom the threefold aspect of wisdom, love, and power is most unfolded. Hence, the wise compassion and understanding of the capable and the with the rescue qualities of leadership, resolution, and self selflessness. The youngers, what do we do with them? She's talking now in metaphorical terms of the people who's like what you would call the sheep, but like, you know, they're very happy watching X Factor and, you know, sports and TV, and that's all they want from life. Very often we expect more of them than they can give breath of mind, power of self control beyond their capacity. And when they become a general nuisance to ourselves, we shut them into a prison, largely depriving them of what little shreds of self respect and self direction as theirs. I'm not advocating universal license for evildoers. Freedom is no freedom to him who has not learned to rule himself. Ah, that, let me read that again to you. Freedom is no freedom to him who has not learned to rule himself. Let that one sink in. But reincarnation would help us to deal wisely by these unfortunate, to educate and stimulate, not to punish and to repress. The best amongst us should should have them in charge for with the children in soul and body large understandings eternal patience and love are most requisite I met a friend the other day who's bounced from one man to the next and you know she's a good person but she's made terrible terrible choices in her personal life and the reason why she's made these terrible choices in her personal life is she desperately wants a man she desperately wants a husband and she's just been a magnet for one loser after the next and when you look at her, you can see that she's very unhappy in how she's living. She knows that her life journey is wrong. But for some reason, on this version of, of her incarnation, she does not have, for whatever reason, the ability to be strong enough to say, I don't need this nonsense. The irony being if that she didn't desperately need a man, she'd probably find a man that was just right for her. She's not going to learn it in this life. She will learn it in the next one. So it's not tragic. It's just a stage of her development. I know this is very close to Hinduism, and this is a load of dice in many ways too, because it makes you think of things like the reincarnation over there and things like the untouchables, which is probably going too far because that was that became a kind of a class system. But I think if, you, if Hinduism, like all major religions, hadn't become corrupt, there'd be a hell of a lot more compassion for the untouchables than when the class system turned them into subhumans. In education, again, how different would become the outlook? Parents and teachers would recognize that in many cases, a child may be older in the scheme of things than the parents to which he comes. Now tell me about that one. And that our own duty to the child is to try to discover the line of his own higher growth and to aid him in it which may not be in any way very similar to our own. We're talking about the kind of Lisa Simpson dynamic here, where the, the child is, is, is born far more wise and educated compared to the, and intellectually and morally developed than the parents that they come from. I think Marge Simpson is a good example of someone 
that you would never be able to wake up, but it's still that archetype of a good person. Just leave them be. They they know what's right for them in this incarnation. How tolerant, how wide-minded should we grow where we all to know and understand the truth of reincarnation? How wider hearted too? We should realize that among the advanced guard of the nations of the earth, one people is not necessarily superior to another. Not even in the color of their skin is different, but that in their differences lie in their value to their souls of men passing through them and to the universal harmony. How would the war of creeds sink into insignificance? It would be seen that not the latter, but the spirit is which is the matter, is which matters, and that the same devotional temperament which makes a man born in the West an Arden Christian would have would have have made him had he been born in the East a devoted Buddhist. What are the religions but ways to God? And all the ways are his. Why too that scale of superiority in our minds in the different functions of the services of the state? For one point of view, there is no difference in value in the functions or the king on the throne and that the dustman going around his cart. Both are necessary for the common welfare and happiness. All service ranks the same with God. Sex, it is not clear that neither one is superior or inferior to the other but different and complementary, and that we see the world through the eyes of the woman's body in quite another way than which it presents itself to us when living in the man's. You see, this, this is an important one here. This is what's wrong with a lot of modern women today. They're told not to see themselves and men too as complementaries of the opposite gender. And this is why they tell women to be strong and hard and independent, but they don't have an archetypal grounding in the sense they fully understand the the Kali archetype, the Hecate archetype, the Lilith archetype within them. That is not so much a monster, but the the representation of the feminine aspect of the survival of the human consciousness. In the same way, the man has the archetype of the warrior. It's the same thing. It's a complementary thing. And this is why these women who are not archetypally grounded, in fact, they're archetypally deficient, and men have the same problem too, particularly regarding immaturity, that instead of becoming strong, independent women, they, be, women, they become hard, angry bitches who are, they hate all their exes. They go to war against them for all eternity. They think that the only way they can survive in a man's world is being a horror. And this archetypal deficiency has become so disrupted now, so polluted and shattered that we now have things like people saying there's no genders, there's third genders, there's all kinds of genders. This is because well, this will all fall apart again. You see, this is a reflection of the whole energy that's happening. The reduction of science model is falling apart. It can no longer explain things. So it goes into the world of strange matter, dark energy, junk DNA, the the present course of human social and behavioral development across the gender spectrum is likewise falling asunder. We know that we don't we don't have men and women anymore. We have third genders and all the other mixtures and all these other stuff that's coming up. It's falling apart. It will restore itself and it will find equilibrium. But in the meantime, once you know understand what's happening, it makes it less bewildering and less depressing to you. And this lady uses the idea of it being a reincarnated process. Well, societies and cultures reincarnate as well, as well as the thing. So you understand these ideas, just like if you know you can't wake the sheep up, then you don't get upset about it. You work on yourself. And the same thing when you see these things. But what, what is Bruce Jenner doing? Bruce Jenner is an archetypal force. He is just basically showing you what's happening with the gender process at the moment. The artificial incursions upon gender studies for the last 50 years has failed. The volatility of that mix is becoming apparent. And what's happening is the structure is breaking down back into its base forms, which is complementary genders of both sexes. And that she's, she's bringing this idea up here beautifully, I might say. 
and it is no new thought that in the oldest thought in the world, the ancient Egyptians or Chaldeans taught it, modern Hinduism and Buddhism enshrines it, and once in early Christianity, some of the Gnostics, its truth was widely spread. For certain great doctors of the early church taught it, as witnessed the decisions against the Council of Constantinople in the 6th century, but thought officially expunged from Christian doctrine, it never entirely left in the West. But it was held and thought by successive her- her- heretical bodies might through the Middle Ages, Tom of the Cathars here, and by many of the philosophers and secret societies of the Renaissance. Because of the inherent reasonableness, uh, it's institutionally presented itself to the best thoughts of modern times, particularly to the great philosophers of the Germany and half a century ago, and the poets, how often do we find the idea enshrined amongst longing aspirations, if not with certain authority, because it reflects so nearly the yearning after growth into perfection within the human heart. So much would we would achieve, so much awaiting human endeavour. And she has a quote here from a poem, but it's not cited. Albert is but asleep and a forgotten. The soul that rises with us, our life star, heart had everywhere a setting and come it from afar. Well, that's very similar to the book of the law by Crowley, when he says, every man and woman is a star. Think of yourself in that way. Oh, I can hear him going on, eh, Sheridan's promoting Crowley, oh, 660 is fighting as he's No. Grow the fuck up, folks. Start to see humans, other human beings in energy, in, as energy systems. Start to see the world around you as energy systems, developing, migrating, transforming energy systems. If you want to apply a Hinduistic aspect to that, a Buddhist aspect, that's okay. But see them in energy systems. And when you understand them as energy systems, you can actually learn how to work this energy for yourself. And speaking of energy forces, there's some really interesting things happening. Now, you think of things on the archetypal level, things in the, shall we say, the psychic level and how they manifest in the real world as phenomena, just like the Pazuzu energy is manifested in these clown flare-ups. There was an article in Dangerous Minds the other day there about you could actually buy a calendar of people having sex with dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what you, that's what the calendar has, picture images of people having sex with dinosaurs. And then there was also a woman who was arrested in Exeter for having sex with a dinosaur bone. Now, these things don't happen again by accident. The reptilian is strong right now. Now, don't be going like, you know, I'm going to find you, you thought you must be No, no. They're not alien space reptiles. We're talking about archetypes inherent and manifest in the human subconscious, and they express themselves as energy forms in archetypal or zoomorphic ways. So why are people suddenly getting a boner for dinosaurs? Well, and dragons and reptilians. Well, you could say things like Game of Thrones. You have Khaleesi. You know, she's always getting her rack out around these dinosaurs and fire. That kind of sexualizes the idea on a cultural level, perhaps. More likely, we may be seeing a pathological manifestation of an attraction towards psychopaths. Think about it. Think about it. Think, uh, well, let's, let's consider two aspects. One that women are becoming sexually attracted to psychopathic males. There's a flare-up happening at the moment, perhaps. Or, if you look at it in the archetypal sense, the, the, the serpent, more so than the dragon or the reptile, but we'll just, we'll, we'll, you know, indulge me here, represent wisdom, drive, instincts, could it be that women want a real man? I think it's more likely the latter. I think women are sick and tired of all these. We're coming back to the whole thing we mentioned that previous segment about reincarnation and gender breakdown, gender collapse. Women want real sexual relationships with proper intense men. They do. They're sick and tired of the hipsters 
who dress like lumberjacks, look like fucking Grizzly Adams, and the only thing that they can take down is an app from their from their mobile device. They they want men who worry about gluten free products or quinoa or anything like that. They want real men, and that's what that's about. That's what I think it's about. I think women want real strong sexual men. They don't. They want. They want dragons. They don't want pussies. And that's. This is the a reaction to that. You see, the. I'm always telling you. See things in terms of energy systems and psychic weather, and so when something like this happens in society, it's telling you something about something else. There's all you know, like the whole thing of uh, Alephus Levi, the the malediction and the benediction graphic that he made in his magical text, where a, a shadow was held on a wall of the what you call the devil, the Baphomet sign, which is actually a sign of good luck. I use it all the time in photographs. Holds it up against a light, and it, it cast on one hand, it cast the shadow of good, and on the shadow, uh, uh, sorry, on, on, it cast the light of good. On the on the wall, it cast the shadow of a horned devil. That's what that's what it's, that's what it's deflecting. That's the malediction. So when you have, just say, let's say for instance, and it's not necessarily that these these calendars of women being shagged by dragons and dinosaurs and all this kind of thing is the malediction. What's the benediction? Like, what is what what is that the shadow of? And the shadow of that is these hipster males, these these sensitive new age guys. I'm a sensitive new age guy. I like to go to Burning Man and talk shit about rainbows and unicorns. I'm a dragon sex cannon. Oh, yeah, yeah, and so so on. So that's why they're into dragon sex, dinosaur sex, and all this stuff, because they're trying to get away from the weak man. They want the strong man, and the strong man, and also a wise man. They want that. To, it's like the who's your daddy archetype taken to the fore, you know? Like, ooh, your daddy, baby. Ooh, yeah. I'm going to give you some of that dinosaur, some of that dragon sex, baby. Ooh, come on, baby. Ooh, who's your daddy? That's what they want, right? They don't want, you know... Ooh, am I sensitive enough? I, 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 yeah, I can't. <laughs> That's what they don't want. They're sick and tired of that shite. The women want to, The women want a bit of rough and ready. And smart men know this. And that's not necessarily sexual. See, it's all part of the gender breakdown again. You see, the the, the, band, the, the shadow is always cast by the light. The light is like, I suppose so, but long malediction, benediction. How many years have I been telling you this for? See the universe in terms of energy systems and see the human psyche and and cultural shall we say cultural memes and tropes as echoes or reflections of what's not being addressed and your life will be a hell of a lot easier now this week we also had the bloody uh, follow up to the Savile thing with Louis Theroux the second documentary and you all know my feelings on Savile and my theories out there are still sound by them. The thing, some people said it was a whitewash. Maybe it was. Some people said, well, what, what could they do really? What, 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 could, what could Louis Giroux really bring out? And there's a lot of truth to that as well. Look, at the end of the day, I, you know that I believe that Savile was much worse than even what they've said so far. I believe he was a serial killer involved in at least one of the Yorkshire Ripper murders, that of Irene Richardson, the prostitute, at the back of his apartment building. This is why the police wanted his dental imprints and so on. Aside from that, the real issue here is the British royal family. Because if the worst of Savile was to come out, the worst of everything was about him was to come out, it would probably undermine the royal family. It might even bring him down. It would certainly be the end of British society and a lot of the rest of the upper class would be left in a bad way. If they made a decision so poor to allow this guy in their midst and to protect and aid him, it would be the end. And and they will go to any extremes to protect the the British royal family. I mean, look at Prince Philip and the Porfumo scandal. Back in the early mid nineteen sixties, you had this call girl called Christine Keeler, who was involved with a British cabinet minister called Porfumo. At the same time, she was involved with a Russian spy. 
Perfumo was sacrificed for the simple reason that all these sex parties and these orgies that were going down, Prince Philip was at them. And Perfumo was sacrificed to protect Prince Philip. And Prince Philip's file in the Perfumo sex scandal has been sealed until 50 years after his death. That tells you all you need to know. And those of you who think the truth about Savile is going to come out, it won't come out in our lifetime. It'll come out maybe decades, if not hundreds of years to come. That's how the world works. Stop waiting for a result or a validation. If you know in your heart it's true, well, it probably is. I'll see you in a second there.